All right, hello. Um, I'm Rex Astoria, and this is my first video, and it's going to be about Paul von Lettervorbeck, probably one of the most interesting people that I will ever talk about. So I'm starting off strong. Um, Paul von Lettervorbeck. He was a German general in World War One, and he focused specifically on on honorable combat and whatnot, and specifically. He has one moment where he talks directly to Hitler and he says, fuck you, Hitler. That is a direct quote from Paul von Lidovorbeck. So just to give you a small hint of what's to come, his life is absolutely insane. So the First World War, a tremendously large conflict that spread the whole world. It spread from Indonesia to Europe to Asia to the heart of Africa, where our story takes place. Okay, so massive battles were fought in Verdun and in France, the Somme, the Brusilov Offensive in the East changed how war was to be fought. Um, but, but people often forget the kind of niche -er parts of the conflict. Um, for instance, our story takes place in German Ostafrika. I mean, these battles, of course, were very important. Um, perhaps they're not as well known, but their stories are some of the best by far all right so let me introduce to you paul von ledevorbeck the lion of africa one of the most successful generals of all time totally undefeated in battle he faced a force of 300,000 men and he only had 14,000 men at his peak and he one. Okay, so Paul von Lettervorbeck was born to a well-off Pomeranian family of minor nobility in 1870. His father was an army officer, and the young Lettervorbeck was educated at a bunch of different boarding schools. He joined the Cadet Corps at 11 and became a lieutenant in 1890, so he was 20. He graduated valedictorian of his class, so a sign of greatness to come. Uh, he looked up all he looked up to all of the great gentlemen of the day and he really wished to be like them So the Kaiser Count von Moltke Crown Prince Friedrich um, He danced with the ladies in his tight pressed uniform and and one experience that really shaped Paul was when an old officer scolded a young soldier for not asking a lady to dance when she was partnerless so these experiences, they really shaped Leda Vorbeck um, and what he viewed as the, you know, a good gentlemanly soldier. So to him, a soldier that was good was chivalrous, they were clever, they were gentlemanly. You will see this in this command style later. Uh, Leda Vorbeck was always thought of as gentlemanly by everyone around him, like many, many testimonies. One of the number one things that they bring up about Leda Vorbeck was he was a real gentleman. However, the fun times of dancing in Berlin were soon to come to an end, as the year is now 1900, and our protagonist is sent to quell the Boxer Insurrection in China. So he is now a lieutenant in the 4th Foot Guards Regiment. Uh, during his time in China, he got to see Chinese culture, and he absolutely loved it. He would be fascinated with China throughout the rest of his life. Um, he fought guerrilla fighters, right? And he absolutely hated it. Um, however, he learned a lot about combat. And, you know, fighting these guerrilla fighters really trained, you know, trained him on, A, how to fight guerrilla fighters, but what effective guerrilla tactics were. Okay, quick history. So the Boxer Insurrection was a civil war in China in which a coalition of 11 nations fought the Boxers. This is a really intriguing war. And I'd love to talk more about it, but that's a story for another time. Regardless, one of these 11 nations was Britain. And Lettevorbeck, and this is a direct quote from Lettevorbeck, he saw, quote, the clumsiness with which the British troops were moved and led into battle. Paul von Lettevorbeck, 1901. This is, like, <laughs> 1901 equivalent of just absolutely roasting the shit out of the British. Um, I mean, he saw this firsthand. He saw how, like, the the British soldiers were walking with two left feet. And this, you know, really shaped... And think about, it, you know, 15, 13 years down the road, when he's fighting the British, he, he remembers this, right? 
you know, he, he'd be fighting these clumsy British troops just 13 years later. He also worked in close cooperation with the Americans, who also had troops in China. He learned a lot of tactics and strategies in conventional warfare, and that may have helped him down the line. Um, this is also where he learned how to speak, uh, and this is a quote, flawless English, which again would help him tremendously in the war to come when he's fighting English-speaking British. Um, his comrades and colleagues would describe him as fair but strict. He was never a browbeater, but he did insist the best from his men. He moved up the ranks in China and was sent back to Germany in 1901. He learned a lot in China. Uh, his future adversaries, however, would learn nothing. He rested in Germany for a few years and worked for the German general staff, making connections and networking. Later, he would be sent to German Sudwest Africa to deal with the Herero insurrection. Okay, so the now Captain Leda Vorbeck. He saw a lot of action in Sudwest Africa, uh, which is nowadays Namibia, kind of like just north of South Africa. Um, he fought and chased down Herero and Nama forces until all of the Hereros and Nama people, or soldiers that would be, were all grouped into one place at Waterberg, and then the ensuing Battle of Waterberg, where the German forces completely annihilated the Herero um, peoples. They were basically completely shattered from that point on, um, and Leda Vorbeck would always study the Herero tactics because, think about it, it's just a group of poorly armed, poorly trained um, soldiers who are just running around in in Sudwest Africa in essentially just the desert. There's nothing. Um, so Leda Vorbeck had a he had a contingent who tracked down this resistance leader named Jacob Moringa and got into a firefight with him. And Leda Vorbeck was actually wounded and sent to Af South Africa to recover, but not one to be put down. He got back at it, and he tracked down another Herero resistance leader, Samuel Isaac. So he interrogated um, Mr. Isaac, and, but was less concerned with like troop locations or seeing how long they could hold out or negotiating, it, negotiating a surrender. No, Leda Vorbeck wanted to know four main things. He wanted to know how they lived off a country with absolutely no natural resources. Second, how they could run when others could hardly walk. And three, how they seem to not need any food or water during their entire, you know, campaign. Um, and four, how they became one with their ever hostile environment. This is just the desert. How did they live? How did they food? <laughs> how do they get food? How do they get water? Like, how do they do it? And Apparently, Leda Vorbeck would learn these things from Mr. Isaac. Okay, so he would take these lessons to heart. Leda Vorbeck learned a lot from fighting the gorillas. Um, I, it, look, I cannot stress enough how invaluable this knowledge would be. And I feel like for full transparency, I should mention that this war did come with its own genocide. Um, the Herero genocide was one of the first genocides of the 20th century and killed anywhere between 24,000 and 100,000 ethnic Herero and Nama peoples. Um, there's no reason to believe that Leda Vorbeck did commit these genocides, but there's no reason to believe that he didn't commit these genocides. Um, I, but I, I just want to mention it. So after Leda Vorbeck put down the Herrera insurrection, um, he was reassigned to Germany and he was promoted to a major and assigned to the 11th Corps. He stayed there for a little bit and was moved up to the 2nd C Battalion and made connections in Berlin all the way until October of 1913 uh, when he was ordered by the Kaiser to go to German Cameroon. Like midway when he was on the ship going to German Cameroon, the, the Kaiser sent a telegram and said, all right, no, actually ship this guy to German East Africa. Um, so he arrived there April of 1914 and immediately came into conflict with the colonial governor of the time, Dr. Einrich Schnee. Now, immediately, I can guess that you know what kind of person the Schnee character was. Uh, Einrich Schnee? I mean, can you get any more Nazi German supervillain than that? Like, um, Schnee was a deeply racist asshole, and he viewed the people that he governed as superstitious and savage and cruel and who had to be enlightened with pure European ways. B.S. 
uh, after the war, Schnee would join the Nazi party and promote colonialism during the time of the Third Reich. Um, so Leda Vorbeck was basically the opposite of Schnee in every single way. And according to a British general who met the two before the war, and this is a, a quote from this general, Von Ledau gave the impression of being a regular soldier, a man of outstanding ability and a gentleman. Schnee was not the sort of person whom soldiers found engaging. He had not the open look, nor had he the manner of Von Ledau. He struck me as being a small-minded man. This is Brigadier General C.P. Fendall. So during the entire war, Schnee and Lev Warbeck would argue and fight about everything and never agree on anything. Um, so at the, at the start of the war, when you know Germ the, when war had broken out between Germany and the Entente, um, Schnee wanted to take advantage of something called the Treaty of Berlin, which basically a really long uh, some time before this. It was a treaty that said the colonies cannot fight in a war to limit bloodshed um, and that they must res they must stay neutral. So I doubt this scheme would have ever worked really because, you know, Britain was, you know, gearing up and ready to invade. Schnee just worked completely against Von Leto the entire time. Um, so he, Von Leto wanted to seize the initiative and blitz through the German colonies, bordering Germany, East Africa, and capture a ton of supplies. And he would, he really wanted to tie down uh, as many troops as possible in the process. But because of the squabbling, neither party really got their wish, so uh, Von Leto would not be able to seize the initiative, and Schnee would not be allowed to stay neutral. So Von Leto accurately predicted that the British would try to naval invade, and capture the port of Tonga. Uh, with only a few days to prepare, uh, Leda Vorbeck ordered his troops to start digging in. Um, the Battle of Tonga is a very interesting battle that I'm definitely going to cover in the future. Um, more famously known for its other name, the Battle of the Bees, the British got their asses kicked so hard that they shell their own hospital and get stung by an incalculable amount of bees. I mean, after so after this this disaster for the British. They lose a ton of supplies and the Germans capture them all. And they calculated that it was enough supplies to last them for a full year. Um, there were minimal German casualties. However, one high ranking officer was killed, Captain Tom von Prince, who Leda Vorbeck described as splendid and not easily replaceable. Um, Leda Vorbeck was very smart and he knew that he could not really engage the British in an open battle. Uh, it would just completely go wrong for him as the British had more equipment, they had more troops, they had more manpower, they had more everything, they had more food. Um, so, in the opening stages of the war, he ordered his men to attack railways, comm towers, uh, small military outposts. For instance, at the Battle of Jassen, uh, Leda Vorbeck captured a small outpost and two British captains were captured. Um, Captain Hansen and Captain Turner. When these two men were put in front of Leda Vorbeck, he congratulated them on their brave defense and let them go as long as they promised that they would not return the fight. <laughs> Which, <laughs> complimenting your opponent, like, just absolutely kicking their ass and then, like, hey, you guys, you did well, um, but you're here now. Anyway, you can go as long as you promise to not fight. Um, I actually don't know if they didn't, I mean, I, I tried to research this, but believe it or not, there were a lot of Captain Hansons and Captain Turners, and I couldn't really find anything more. Alright, so these small battles and skirmishes really fueled Leda Vorbeck's forces, but he was losing a lot of men, and like he couldn't replace these because there weren't you know regular shipments coming from all of those resources needed to go to the Western Front and the Eastern Front. They were not you know diverting even just a thousand men to. Uh, to German South West Africa as if they would get there anyway, right? Um, so he really had to scale back his attacks even though they were, you know, really inflicting heavy damage on the British. Um, these victories, though, brought morale, like, straight through the roof. Every single German soldier was, like, so confident that they were going to win. Um, and cr crushing loss after crushing loss really didn't do well for the British soldiers who 
you know, just losing so much, you have no faith in your commanders, morale absolutely plummeted. Now I'm going to talk about both sides of the conflict, uh, the British and the Germans. Both sides made extensive use of Askari soldiers. Askari is a African warrior. So they conscripted the native Africans, or sometimes they volunteered, particularly more German volunteers. In the British command, there was no room for promotion for African soldiers. Um, but for the Germans, uh, there were black NCOs, you know, black African soldiers could move up in the ranks. Uh, the British, of course, had a only white officer corps. Uh, the German Schutzterpe, Schutzterpe is protection f troops. They were paid about double what the soldiers of the British King's African Rifles were paid. <clears throat> so, uh, also, Leda Vorbeck spoke fluent Swahili and instantly gained the respect of all of his Askari soldiers, and they absolutely loved him. Uh, this was also due to him being unusually progressive for the time. Uh, he said, quote, uh, and this is a direct quote from Leda Vorbeck, we are all Africans here. Um, he created the first racially integrated unit in modern military history. And according to a historian, Charles Miller, um, this is a quote from Charles Miller, uh, it is probable that no white commander of the era had so keen an appreciation of an African's worth not only as a fighting man, but as a man. And that is something that has really stuck with me when I think about uh, Leda Vorbeck. He was, he understood the worth of a human uh, as, as a soldier, and even further beyond that, and was not racist. Which, again, this was 1914 to 1918. This was really, really progressive for the time, and I absolutely commend him for that. So, since Leda Vorbeck Use this indiscriminate conscription, the Schutzturp expanded to its peak size of 14,000 men, still of course only a fraction of what the British had. These German troops were also reinforced when the cruiser SMS Königsberg was scuttled off of the uh, Rufiji River Delta. So the Germans got the men, the supplies, and the heavy artillery of the ship. So that was a big boon for the Germans. So General Jan Smuts uh, was a British general of the time, and he would actually become one of the leaders of South Africa. He would launch the Tabora Offensive in March of 1916 with 45,000 men. This saw a lot of Orbeck's forces pushed mostly out of German East Africa, although the Brits paid dearly for every inch of land. I must ask you to remember that a lot of Orbeck's strategies and techniques were something that he learned during the Boxer Insurrection when he fought against Chinese partisans, and the Herrera Insurrection when he fought again against partisans and learned how to live off the land. Right? So he's using all of this knowledge that he gained from his wars previous and really effectively using them in the big... Right, so as this is all going on in the Tabor Offensive, several uh, Nigerian and South African battalions attempt to encircle a very large portion of Leda Vorbeck's army. So, Leda Vorbeck uh, brings reinforcements to a basically hopeless situation and nearly counter encircles the entire, uh, the entire you know, Nigerian and South African corps. However, the Brits did attack from the rear, so they were able to uh, break their, uni their units out again. Um, but the, Ascar the German Ascaris fought very bravely, and the, Ger and the British, rather, took a lot of casualties. Um, this was a victory for the Germans because they caused a lot of British casualties. However, the German forces used a lot of ammo. Uh, plus, they had taken up to you know 600 casualties, and they could not replace those. So, you know, the Allied losses were many, but they were replaceable. The German losses were few, but they were not replaceable. So, and, and now they have no ammunition, basically no food, and their guns are old. They are very obsolete. They're they're smoke. They are not even smokeless powder. And after this uh, very uh, spectacular battle, ugh, I don't like saying that, after this very intriguing battle, uh, he was promoted to Major General. So this is when Portugal joins the war uh, against Germany, and he crosses into Portuguese East Africa, and he understands that he's going to be completely cut off from his own supply lines, but it's not like that's doing a whole lot for him anyway. But this is, you know, this is a sacrifice he needs to make. 
Um, they become a wandering tribe, just like many of the Scarlets were from, actually, uh, before the war. Uh, he sees a Portuguese encampment up ahead. Uh, his numbers are few, his bullets are scarce, but it's now or never. He needs to make this attack. Uh, so the Battle of No... Gosh, how do I say this? Sorry, I'm very... I'm very American. The Battle of No Mano is underway. Uh, his first action is to dismiss all of his rookie and unequipped soldiers and any of the camp followers that just chill around with his army. So he dismisses all those people because he needs to slim down his force as much as possible. <clears throat> so now he sees the Portuguese, right? And he reconnaissances is the area. So we have Major Joa Teixeira Pinto. So his name is Major Pinto. Um, so this Major Joa Teixeira Pinto, he has set up a camp, but no defensive positions. Um, this is despite being warned by the British of an impending German attack um, at 0700 hours on the 25th of November. At 0700, artillery opens fire on the camp uh, across the river, and this distracts uh, Major Pinto. Uh, the Germans move across the river behind the Portuguese camp and storm it. Uh, the Germans use the last of their artillery shells in a diversionary attack. Now they have no ammo no shells no guns no artillery no machine guns no uniforms no food no medicine nothing yet they still kill 200 portuguese and capture 700 men this is let masterpiece because you know how many men he lost he lost seven men and this is just an unbelievable force like he has done basically the impossible um but it was helped by several factors a large part of this defeat was the will of the Portuguese collapsing instantly. They had 30,000 more rounds that they could have continued the fight with, but they were new, inexperienced, and not had, had not built defensive positions. And they were left leaderless because Major Pinto died early in the battle. They were left naked and afraid. It was early in the morning. They hardly even, they were like, hardly even waking up. And many were still in their pajamas. Uh, this was an absolute miracle for Leda Vorbeck, and he ordered his men to ditch their German guns for the new British and Portuguese guns. And they also captured a ton of supplies, and they could hold out for the foreseeable future. This is, like, pretty sad. I don't like talking about death and destruction and, like, making jokes about it. So I'll give you a happy tale. Um, so Leda Vorbeck had a glass eye when he was injured back in the Herrera Insurrection. And um, one day it popped out and it was lost. <laughs> and one of the Ascaris on guard duty, they found it uh, and brought it back to him. And when the Ascari soldier was like, you know, why'd you put your eye in a shrub? Leda Vorbeck responded in this, uh, a quote, I have placed it there to make sure you were doing your duty. <laughs> All right, um, but now, you know, back to the terrible stuff. Uh, so our protagonist's next engagement with the enemy is the Battle of... The Battle of Nahamakura? And after the embarrassing defeat of the Portuguese at Nomano, the commanding general of the British troops uh, in the area, General Jacob von Denventer, did not trust the Portuguese troops at all and just saw them as a liability. So, and this belief was reinforced when Leda Vorbeck attacked the town of Nahamakura and the Portuguese garrison surrendered immediately. Um, the British troops in the town did put up a stellar resistance, but were eventually overrun. The Germans raided the storages of the town and seized large amounts of supplies, ammo, and lots of quinine. And quinine is a drug that protects uh, against malaria. Uh, the Germans also found something else. <laughs> Incredibly large amounts of Portuguese alcohol. So the Germans had, according to Leda Vorbeck, a wholesale jollification. Uh, after their victory, they retreated back to German East Africa, and the war ended a few months later. Uh, Jacob von Denventer got the telegram that the war ended um, before Leda Vorbeck and handed it to him. Whatever remnants of the Schutzturpe there was handed, handed over their arms and surrendered at Abercorn in British Zambia. Uh, Leda Vorbeck's final army consisted of 30 officers and 12 enlisted Germans, and had about 1,200 Ascari soldiers. Uh, the German POWs were repatriated, and Germany secured an early release for many of his Ascari troops. 
And I really want to stress how much the Ascari troops really respected Leda Vorbeck. This is this is an, a this is a quote from an Ascari soldier. And he says, "I have been asked to say this to you, General. Where will you go now? Where you go, we will go with you. And if this is not the time, then wait until my son grows up to be a warrior, and he will take my place and go with you. We will go with you, General." will we not and like this is so heartwarming and then according to historian robert gowdy uh to a man the ascari stepped forward ready to follow their commander to the ends of the earth but von leta vorbeck held them back with a gesture and kept on marching his war is over now um and then again after this heartwarming tale i have to say not fun stuff um I should also mention, like the Herrera insurrection, uh, for full transparency, I should mention that uh, the war in East Africa killed a lot of civilians because wherever the armies went, they left a trail of destruction, right? And they had to, you know, steal a bunch of food from the locals uh, and ransacked, you know, all the all their storages, right? And this is a quote from Ludwig Depp, who was the director of the hospital that was blown up at Tonga. Um, quote, behind us, we left destroyed fields, ransacked magazines, and for the immediate future, starvation. We are no longer agents of culture. Our track is marked by death, plundered, and evacuated villages. The war in Africa was over, but this is n by no means the end of Leda Vorbeck's story. Uh, he was the perfect man in the eyes of most Germans, and he was the only German general to successfully invade a portion of the British Empire, right? And since he was literally undefeated in battle, it was a refreshing sight to see a general that was laden with so many victories when all the other generals only really brought defeat for Germany. And many people have said that he is just the embodiment of what the German Empire ideally stood for. He was charismatic, he was charming, he was clever, and above all else, a gentleman. When Leda Vorbeck and his Schutzturpa soldiers walked through the Brandenburg Gate, they were hailed as heroes. Um, his popularity with the German people soared, his popularity would actually save his life. Um, Leda Vorbeck stayed in the Reichswehr, Germany's post-war army, and he was actually called to defeat a communist revolution called the Spartacist Uprising. However, he did not stay in the Reichswehr for long because of his involvement in the Kapp Putsch. Um, the Kapp Putsch was a failed nationalist uprising by the rebellious Wolfgang Kapp. And this is why a lot of people today really don't like him, because it, this was a nationalist group. Um, he attempted to join politics, and he ran in the Monarchist Party, uh, because he was still loyal to the Kaiser above all. Um, but he had very limited success there. And this is where we see Leda Vorbeck's first interaction with the Nazis. Um, although he was uh, very patriotic, bordering on the point of nationalism, uh, he very much distrusted Hitler and his movement. Uh, and that's a quote from, quote, distrusted Hitler and his movement. However, uh, Hitler did eventually come to power, and he offered the ever-popular Leda Vorbeck job, uh, a job as an ambassador to England. I mean, this will go down in history as the biggest alpha giga chad move ever, right? Uh, he said straight to the face of the most powerful man in Europe, uh, and, and totally, like, just the most evil, powerful man in Europe. A man who, who at the snap of his fingers, could remove him and s just sentence him to torture for the rest of his life. He said, <clears throat> Hitler, go fuck yourself. Paul von Leda Vorbeck. This legend. He would outlive the Fuhrer and his evil regime. Um, he attended some army maneuver exercises with these New Age generals and officers. Um, but when World War II started, he was never called back to active service. Um, another small de detail, Theodor von Hippel was one of Leda Vorbeck's junior officers, and he ended up creating the Brandenburgers, uh, which was an ultra-elite Nazi special forces group. Um, I thought I, I thought I might mention that, you know. Um, the war did not treat Leda Vorbeck very well, though. Um, he lost absolutely everything. This is not the fitting end for our very protagonist who said fuck you straight to Hitler. Um, a general undefeated a genius of war 
Uh, it is ironic then that he lost both of his sons, Arndt and Rudger, and his stepson Peter while serving in the Wehrmacht. Right. Um, he had two daughters, uh, both who died when they were less than a year old. The war took a toll on his mental health, and he really suffered during this time. Um, his wife, uh, Martha Walroth, uh, died in 1953 after she lost everything to um, his house was reduced to rubble because of the constant air raids and towards the end of the war he was really only supported by his uh, once enemies Jan Smuts would give him uh, like stipends and Richard Meinertagen who again is someone I must cover uh, also gave him stipends so Lodov Orbeck uh, traveled back to Dar es Salaam to meet the surviving Askaris that served under him and they greeted him with their old marching song, Haya Safadi. The great general would die in 1964. The West German government of the time flew out two former Ascaris to attend his funeral. He was put into the ground with his iconic slouch hat and had full military honors. I guess I'll leave you with one last story about our great general. About a year after Ledvorbeck passed away, the Bundestag decided to give back pay to all of the surviving Ascaris. The Ascaris had little proof of their service, uh, no documents. The most they had was old scraps of uniforms or letters from Leda Um uh, But the Germans uh, that were sent out to give the Ascaris back pay said that, uh, well, all of the Ascaris should know how to do the Prussian Manual of Arms. And not a single man failed the test a testament to Prussian military discipline. Leda Vorbeck was one of the few undefeated generals in history, the only undefeated of the world wars. He was soldierly, he was polite, he was clever, he was well-spoken, he was humorous, and above all, a gentleman to the highest degree. Uh, now, this is why I wish to honor him by spreading the word of his exploits and his many adventures that he may never die and be immortalized in the minds of many. Quote, he belonged to the olden days. I have never met another German who has given me such a strong impression of what Imperial Germany stood for. Karen Blixen. So that was the story. Paul von Ludwig. A um, very interesting character. Uh, I, I definitely, there are definitely some admirable traits to this man. Um, saying fuck you to Hitler and then living to tell the tale. I mean, is there anything cooler? Also, this is my first video, so uh, let me know if you like the format, whoever sees this, and uh, I'd love to do a lot more of this. I love telling stories, and I absolutely hate how history is taught in classrooms, and even if you've taken the most rigorous AP ultra history courses in your high school, I, I doubt that you've heard of this man. I, I mean, this is very interesting. I'll link some further reading in the description. Um... So, I guess this has been Rex Historia. I'm out.